Good morning and a very warm welcome to this webinar on the state of play update of program development. We'll just give a few seconds to make sure that everybody in the lobby waiting to join the webinar is properly in, in the webinar room so that we can get going with the webinar. So we'll just wait another 20 seconds or so before we get going. Very good. Okay, I think we will start the webinar today. Everybody seems to be coming into the webinar room, and uh, I think we can just get going with the with the actual webinar. So, very very good morning to all the participants. It's very great to have you on board this morning, and thank you for sparing the hour to be part of this webinar. My name is Lisa Esperson and I work for the Joint Secretariat. Maybe some people know me, maybe some don't. So welcome to everybody, those that know me and those that don't. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Sarah Hodson, Anna Pince and Jenny Thompson, who will be giving presentations. You can see uh, Jenny and Anna there on the screen. Now, it's been a while since we've actually had a physical event, and that was one of the reasons we decided to organize this webinar, because a lot has been going on, especially in developing the new program behind the scenes. And we're very keen to update you and share the processes and our activities with you so that you know where we are in terms of the, the new program or the program development. So that hence the webinar. Before we, I mean, I'll outline the, the content of the webinar for you in a moment, but before we do that, just a few technicalities. Um, obviously quite important when everything's taking place online. So we can, um, well, you can hear and see us, but we can't hear and see you. That's the way this webinar functions, but that doesn't mean to say that we really, really wouldn't like, or we would really would like your comments and questions as we go through the webinar, because we will, or we have time allocated at the end to come back to your questions and answer as many of them as we possibly can. So we'll collect them as we go through um, the the actual webinar. We won't take uh, questions off to each presentation, but rather take them at the end. Um, from a practical perspective, if you want to ask a question and you want to like to be brought up at the end of the webinar, when you're putting your question, please put it in the chat box function on the right hand side. And after you've asked your question, please remember to put a question mark because we have a question and answer um, facility in the webinar so if you put a question mark it will pick it up as a question and then we can bring it up at the end if we don't come back to your question it's because we don't have time um, but we will try and address as many questions as we can at the end uh, another piece of information is that we're actually recording this webinar so that's for your information and we will paste the, the copy or a link to the recording on our program website after the after the webinar finishes Great, I think that's most of the technicalities. Then I will just go on to say a little bit about what we'll be presenting or telling you about today. So in a moment, I'll hand over to Sarah, who will be saying about a little bit about where we are with the program, uh, how you can get involved and the different processes that are currently underway in, in planning and developing the new program. Then she will hand over to Jenny and uh, Anna, who will say a little bit about the preliminary or initial findings from our public consultation, which is still open until the end of September. But we've had a quick look. Uh, it's been open since uh, the middle of July. So we had an initial analysis to see where we are and uh, some of the findings or, or feelings uh, coming out of the public consultation. And we've tried to put those together so we can share the initial direction of that with you. And at the end, I'll touch on how you can get involved in the programming process. Sarah will also mention this in a minute in her presentation, but we'll just recap at the end. Great. Um, I think that's the main points before I hand over to Sarah. So then I would very much welcome Sarah. And um, hello, Sarah. And to say something about the current state of the play for the programming process. Thank you very much, Lisa. And welcome to all of you for joining our webinar. We are very happy to see you, uh, or not see you, uh, as the case may be. Um, we're really glad that you could join us today, and we hope that we can give you the information you're looking for about the development of our program in the next program period during this webinar. 
as Lisa said, my name is Sarah, Sarah Holson, and I am the program and project coordinator of the North Sea Region program. My task this morning is to give you a very brief overview of where we stand with the program development process and where we're heading over the next several months. The new program officially covers the period of 2021 to 2027. However, as many of you may be familiar with, um, there's an overlap between the current program, which run, ran or is running from 2014 to 2020, and the next program. Thus, uh, most of the projects that we currently fund uh, won't actually finish during this program period, but rather in the years 2021 to 2023. So there is this, this overlap between the two. At the same time that we are still helping projects that are implementing during this program, we're trying to get the next program up and running. Um, this work officially began last November of 2019, and we anticipate that it won't be finished until roughly the end of 2021. So I'm going to take you through the main contributions to the new program, uh, what, what we're taking into account as we develop it, uh, give you a very brief overview of the timeline between now and the end of 2021, and finally tell you a little bit about where the uncertainties still lie in this whole process. So the three main contributions that I want to touch on today, <clears throat> there are more, but these are the three principal ones. Um, are the stakeholder engagement, which you can see on the slide, the scoping study, and the meetings that we're holding. The stakeholder engagement is quite a long process. It began in the spring, and it will run through November of this year, and it incorporates two principal parts. The first is the core stakeholder consultation, which takes into account the uh, background from the different participating countries in the program, the policies that are interesting to them or that are important to them, um, wh what they think is important in terms of the policy objectives that we should incorporate in the next program and so forth. And this process of consulting with our core stakeholders is at its conclusion. The analysis has been completed and it will be presented next week at one of the meetings, which I will touch on in a minute, of our program preparation group. We also have the public consultation, which Lisa has uh, already mentioned. And this is where we try to take into account the opinions, the thoughts, uh, the backgrounds, the experiences of the people who might be interested in being in projects in the future or being otherwise um, participating in our program in the next program period. And the main method by which we are getting these opinions is a survey, an online survey, which Lisa also alluded to. Uh, we launched it in July and it will be completed on the 30th of September. So if you have not already filled in our survey uh, about what you think the next program should include, please do so. Um, we have a link to that survey, which will be provided during this webinar. And again, the deadline is the 30th of September. My colleagues, Anna and Jenny, will be telling you a little bit about the preliminary findings. We've had nearly 300 uh, responses to the survey, which is fantastic, but we can always gather more to, to get as well-rounded uh, an idea of your thoughts as possible. In addition, uh, we are also gathering opinions of the current project uh, community on our online monitoring system. And we have a, survey, a series of surveys on the different parts of that. And that has also been launched and will be completed uh, or closed on the 18th of September. So if you are currently in a project or have been in a project with our program this period, we would really appreciate your feedback on how the online monitoring system works so that we can improve it for the next period. So that's the stakeholder engagement. And we anticipate that will be completed as a process in November of this year. In addition, we have what is called the scoping study. The scoping study was carried out by external providers, a uh, group called North Consortium, and it lays the foundation for the main EU national and regional policies that feed into the decisions on what the program, the next program should cover. Uh, we take into account those policies, 
the key statistical indicators for the region, and where the participating countries stand on those policies and what they find are the principal, uh, what should be the principal input for the next program. That is the scoping study. It has also be co been completed and it will be presented at ne next week's meeting, uh, which I'm going to get to now. The third main contribution to our next program is meetings uh, by what we call the program preparation group, which consists of representatives from each of the participating countries in the next program. These meetings are where the main items for the new, the main issues for the new program are discussed and decisions are made. And with that, I think I'll switch to the timeline to explain to you when those meetings happen and what we're looking at for uh, a completion of the pro program. So we are here in September, as you can see on the left side of the timeline. The scoping study will be presented next week at our next program preparation group meeting. Uh, the core stakeholder analysis will also be presented at that meeting. And at that meeting and the one two weeks later, the main discussions will happen in the group about the content of the next program. We hope that we will have some decisions about the main thematic areas and the key focus areas under those thematic areas so that we can actually draft what we call the operational program, which is the document on which the next program is built. We have other meetings, as you can see along the top, uh, one in November, one in January next year, and if all goes well, one in March next year, where the final draft of the operational program will be approved. Under the timeline, you can see we'll be working on drafts of that operational program throughout this period. The stakeholder engagement feeds into that. And as I said, if all goes well, barring unforeseen circumstances, we will be able to launch our new program in the autumn of next year. However, uh, there are things that could come up. There are still some question marks, some uncertainties. And that's what I'll get to last. There are several, as you can see on this slide. The first is the program geography. And here, um, for those of you who do not know, uh, the United Kingdom, which has been a participating country in our program, over the last several program periods, has officially announced in the summer of this year that they will not participate in Interreg next program period, so they will not be participating. Norway has also communicated to us that while they have participated in their entirety uh, in this program period and, and in the past, in the next program period, the northernmost counties of Trumps, Finnmark, and Norland will not be included in the program area. In addition to that, the Netherlands and Flanders are currently discussing the inclusion of additional provinces in their countries in the program area, but this has not been finalized. It is still under discussion. So at the moment, the program geography is coming together, but it isn't final. In addition to the program geography, we have the question of COVID. As you all know, and this is why we are on a webinar instead of in person. COVID-19 uh, could very well, it has impacted our ability to meet and discuss as a program preparation group and joint secretariat. So all of the meetings since um, I believe it was May or June have been online. Next week's meeting will be online and I anticipate the rest of this calendar year they will be online. And this does have an impact on how well we can discuss informally and network, although we're doing the very best we can. On the flip side of that um, is the question of how COVID builds into the next program um, and how and whether the new program should discuss uh, the impacts or the potential impacts of a pandemic. Uh, the word that is often floated right now is resilience, how we can make uh, projects address resilience and, and the ability to react to things like a pandemic. So that is also up uh, for discussion. The budget and the regulations. Uh, the budget has not been finalized for the program. Uh, we anticipate that the multi-financial framework will be finalized by the end of this calendar year. Uh, and then we will have some final numbers that the program can then find out what our particular budget is um, soon after, but we do not know 
when that will actually be finalized. The regulations are also in good shape, but they have not been uh, approved by Parliament, the European Parliament yet. So while we anticipate that will be ready by the end of the year, it is not um, an absolute certainty. Finally, the content of the program, which I've already discussed to some extent, um, this ties in with the contributions to the uh, program development process, the meetings at which decisions will be made, and ultimately which thematic priorities we will fund in the new program. And that is what Jenny and Anna are going to give you some insight to, the preliminary findings of the public consultation up to now, uh, which will make a contribution to the content that we finally decide on for the next program. So without further ado, I turn it over to Anna and Jenny. Thank you. Hi everyone, again I'm back and that's just to say that before we go over to Anna and Jenny we actually have a small poll for you because we've been telling you quite a lot now about what we've been up to for programming so we're just interested um, Sarah mentioned um, the public consultation which is open she also mentioned the um, the OMS the online monitoring system surveys where we're trying to collect our colleagues feedback and stakeholders feedback on what they think about the online monitoring system and suggestions for improvement and we also have a LinkedIn group, it's called a stakeholder group in LinkedIn, um, where we post updates and other colleagues post updates about the programming process and other relevant features for this. So we would be very interested now to have your opinion or to know what you've been involved in at, up until this stage. So we have a survey, um, if we can put that up now, thank you very much, where we would just like to ask you, so what you know what we've been doing now since Sarah has uh, outlined that, but what have you been doing? Have you already participated in the public consultation survey? Have you filled in any of the surveys for the online monitoring system? Um, or have you joined uh, the LinkedIn stakeholder group that we have? Um, it would be great if you could just select which ones you have already been part of for this poll here, and then we'll look at the results and see how active you've been um, so far. And while you're doing that, I would just say it's not too late. We'll come to that at the end, but there's still time to be part of all three of these initiatives. So if you haven't already been involved, there is a chance to do so. So thank you, Anamika. Maybe we can have a look at the results then. Okay, thanks. Very good. Okay, so quite a lot of participation, 25 people out of 66 have uh, already participated in the consul public consultation. Um, 12 out of 66 involved have filled in one of the online monitoring system surveys and 15 out of 66 have signed up for the LinkedIn group. So that's actually quite a good, or quite an impressive amount of uh, involvement to date. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll come back to that at the end of the webinar just to re-emphasize how you can get involved in all these different processes. So don't worry if you feel a bit overwhelmed by the amount of things going on. We'll come back to this at the end. So the next thing is to hand over to Anna and Jenny, who will say something about the uh, initial findings or analysis of the public consultation. So welcome, uh, Anna and Jenny. Thank you very much. So now it's our turn. Welcome everyone also from our office. Uh, my name is Jenny Thompson and I'm here today with my colleague Anna Pins. We are both project advisors at the North Sea Region Program. And we will now, as already announced, first of all, provide you with some general information about the public consultation survey that was maybe already covered by Lisa or Sarah, but just um, to remind you. So first of all, the public consultation survey can be found online and you can see the link to the, to the survey at the top of your screen. It was launched in July uh, this year and we have already received around 300 responses. Interesting to see is that the participation varies from country to country. We can see on the slide that Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium have been very active so far. Sweden, Denmark and Norway have also been involved and we have only seen few responses from the UK so far. Other parts of Europe 
or outside of Europe. The important information for the ones of you that have not participated yet is that the survey is still open until to the end of this month, so end of September. And uh, please feel free to provide us with your input. It's very much appreciated because your input will provide a basis for the discussions that are going on in the meetings that Sarah mentioned, so the program preparation group meetings and um, the six member states of the future program, they will in the end take the decision, but based also on your input from this public stakeholder survey. Anne and I will now guide you um, through uh, some of the initial results of the survey. And that's only a small part of the survey that we will touch upon that is actually dealing with um, some of the thematic areas and the key topics that have been identified. Um, as a starting point, um, I would like to say that the um, Commission has based its proposal for the next Interact programs on two main policies. The first is the Green Deal and the second is the Digital Agenda. And based on those two main policies, there have been five thematic areas defined that could be included in the next North Sea Region program. And as you can see on this slide now, there is great, great support so far for the thematic area, a greener Europe, followed by support for a smarter Europe, a more connected Europe, a more social Europe, and a Europe to closer to citizens is also considered relevant, but to a lower degree. Let me put it like that. And uh, we will now guide you through the current status quo of the feedback on the key topics with regard to these five thematic areas. And we will start out with the first one, a smarter Europe. And Anna, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about that. I can do that. Thank you, Jenny. So the, the European Commission has not only proposed those five um, thematic areas, as we call them, but also within each thematic area, several key topics. The first thematic area, a smarter Europe, is supposed to focus on innovation and smart economic transformation. Within that, there are four key topics and the um, support for those key topics in the public consultation survey varies quite a lot, as you can see on the diagram. Um, we asked for the importance of each of those key topics on a scale from one, not important at all, to five, very important. And the figure here shows you the weighted average of the responses we have received so far. And as you can see, uh, the, the respondents consider the first key topic, enhancing research and innovation capacities and the uptake of advanced technologies as the most relevant key topic under Smarter Europe, followed by the key topic of the digital transformation and digitalization. Uh, this is followed by skills for smart specialization, industrial transition and entrepreneurship. And last but not least, the least uh, important key topic as of right now, is the third topic, um, the growth and competitiveness of SMEs and job creation in SMEs. In the survey, we not only asked for quantitative input, but also for some more elaborations and, and feedback on the, on the thematic area, Smarter Europe. And here I would like to point out that many of the respondents make a close connection between the thematic area, a Smarter Europe, and the thematic area, a greener Europe. For example, by pointing out topics such as circular economy and climate change adaptation, which could be addressed under a smarter Europe by providing innovative solutions to the challenges raised. And I think that um, brings us smoothly mm -hmm. over to the next thematic area, a greener Europe, and Jenny is going to say a bit more about mm -hmm. that. Exactly. So the uh, second uh, thematic area is called a greener and low carbon Europe. And there are in total seven key topics identified that could be dealt with in the next program. And I would like to highlight one more time, as Anna already did for the first thematic area. We have asked our stakeholders or these stakeholders to rate the importance of these um, key topics on a scale from one not important to five most important. And uh, these are um, the weighted averages of the responses we have received so far. And this explanation is also relevant for the, uh, for the other graphs that we are presenting. As we can see, biodiversity 
seems to be a clear winner uh, up till now, followed by um, an interest in circular economy. Also, climate adaptation and water management uh, seem to be a relevant topic, whereas renewables and smart grids have not received the highest ranks. And the least important topic, at least at the moment, seems to be energy efficiency. But I would like to point out that this can, of course, change during the next few weeks, also depending on your input. As Anna said, in addition to the rating, we have received further input from the stakeholders. And I can tell you that for this thematic area, a greener Europe, um, the results we have received go nicely along with what you can see in the, in the graph displayed on the slide. I would like, however, to make two more points. The first one is that stakeholders have highlighted the Green Deal several times. So this thematic area, a greener Europe, can be seen as a good instrument to achieve the goals set out in the Green Deal. And the second point I would like to make is that several stakeholders have made uh, connections to transport. So transport issues, as well as a reduction of CO2 emission, seem to be clearly linked for some stakeholders to uh, the thematic area at Greener Europe, even though we have a thematic area called a more connected Europe that is actually dealing with transport issues and could also potentially be chosen for the next program. And I will now directly dive into this thematic area that is called a more connected Europe. You can see there are four key topics that have been chosen and most interest seems to be at the moment um, for a multimodal urban transport followed by better connections to the TEN-T network. So the Trans-European Transport Network. And that key topic is also, <laughs> sorry, that key topic is also um, covering cross-border transport issues. Digital infrastructure, sorry about the lights. <laughs> Digital infrastructure seems to be um, the third important topic chosen among the stakeholders so far. And last but not least, the development of a sustainable, intelligent, and more secure trans-European transport network is chosen as being least important. Um, on top of that, I would like to mention what we have seen apart from the rating, and that is that stakeholders have mentioned the wish for alternatives for individual car use several times, and alternatives for fossil fuels. And I can tell you that hydrogen was mentioned several times, so that seems to be an important topic for the future. And also, in addition to the rating, we can see here, stakeholders have mentioned uh, the digitalization of transport several times by, for example, applying smart and intelligent transport systems. And that's it for a more connected Europe. Let's move on with the next thematic area that is a social, more social Europe. Exactly. And I will tell you a bit more about the findings, the, the interim findings we have on this thematic area. Um, the Commission views a more social Europe to focus on skills, education and health and has hereby proposed five key topics. Um, and again, here we have asked for the relevance of each of the key topics. The most relevant key topic as of right now in the survey is the topic healthcare, ensuring equal access to healthcare and fostering the resilience of health systems. This is followed by education and training, which is about um, inclusive education and training and ensuring access to education and training. Um, thirdly, the key topic social inclusion is considered relevant, followed by the role of cultural tourism and economic development um, social cohesion and social innovation. And last but not least, the key topic enhancing the effectiveness of labor markets and access to quality employment is considered, as of right now, the least important key topic. But as Jenny already said, of course, this can change until the end of the month, depending on the contributions and responses of you as the public stakeholders to the program. I think one key topic that needs to be highlighted in regard to the more social Europe that has been very high on the agenda and has been mentioned several times by the respondents is, of course, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, especially in regard to the key topic, healthcare. Um, yeah. 
and that also feeds back to the resilience, um, crisis resilience that Sarah mentioned in the beginning of our projects. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, the European Commission has proposed the thematic area a Europe closer to citizens. Essentially, this thematic area should enable multi-sectoral approaches to territorial challenges with a focus on citizen involvement. And um, as of right now, the Commission has proposed two key topics in that regard. In this, in regard to the thematic area, which basically is about geographical indications where this thematic area can be applied. And you can see on the slide that the rural and coastal areas are considered somewhat more relevant than the urban areas. But it should be mentioned here that currently on European level, there are discussions ongoing to combine those geographical indications into one um, indication termed all territories, which would make the distinction presented here obsolete. Mm -hmm. That's it very briefly on the overview of the different thematic areas. Um, just to recap, the European Commission has proposed those five thematic areas, a smarter Europe, a greener Europe, a more connected Europe, uh, a more social Europe, and a Europe closer to citizens. At the end of the day, it is up to the member states of the North Sea Region Programme to decide which of these thematic areas should be included and made available in the new programme. But really, this is where your input comes in, because, of course, what the stakeholders on the ground need and the preferences of the stakeholders are highly relevant mm -hmm. in that decision-making process. So, as already said, the survey is going to run until the end of the month. Um, if you haven't participated yet, please do so. Um, uh, apart from asking about the content and the preferences for the content of the future program, we had also have some more operational questions in the survey, for example, about project design, about mm -hmm. crisis resilience, and also about um, project approaches. So which kind of activities and which kind of project approaches the new program should fund independent from the actual thematic area that a project is applying under. And we thought instead of just presenting you with the findings to that, it might be fun for everyone involved to, um, to answer that in a survey question. Um, I'm going to pull that up right now. And that is taken from the online survey. Um, you should be able to see the survey on the screen now. It's a multiple choice survey. And the question reads, which project approaches do you consider relevant in the new program? And I give you a couple of minutes to fill out um, the survey. And you can just um, scroll down if needed to see, the, to see more um, answer possibilities. I can already see that pilots and demonstrations are considered highly relevant. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share the, the results in a minute. Um, skills development, bottom-up approaches are really important. Um, so I can see that so far 44% of participants have responded. Let's just wait another couple of seconds. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will end the voting now and share the results with you. So as you can see, pilots, trials, and demonstrations are considered highly relevant as a project approach. Um, and so is tripling for triple, for triple helix collaboration. So the involvement of citizens, researchers, SMEs, and public authorities. Um, Cross-topic collaboration, mm -hmm. multi-sectoral approaches are considered important bottom-up approaches. Mm -hmm. I think generally there's a good support for the different approaches. Yeah. So that's clearly something that we need to take into consideration when drafting the new program and that the PPG, the, the member states, um, can take into consideration. I would like to point out that the results received here will not feed into the analysis, mm -hmm. um, but this question is also involved in uh, entailed in the public consultation survey. So if you have strong preferences on this or would like to share your input, please go to the um, consultation survey if you have not yet done so. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it from our end. That would be from our end. We will hand over to Lisa, I guess. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation, Jenny and Anna, and a good oversight into some of the initial feedback that we've had from the consultation so far. So 
we will just before I'll present this slide and then we will have some question and answers and I could just see as we were going through the the presentation um, one colleague was asking with the slides for the webinar be available afterwards and yes they will so we will make sure that when we put the recording of this on the program website we also attach the slides so you'll be able to share these or look at them again if you'd like to so we have now just kind of recapping on how you can get involved in the programming process. We've been, I think, touched on every single one of these points uh, everybody has in their presentations today. Um, but so you, you must now never be able to forget these dates. But the deadline for the public consultation is the 30th of September. So if you haven't already been part of this, there is a chance to do so. And of course, the results we presented today that any, Anna and Jenny presented were in fact the results that we've had in so far, the initial analysis. Um, and there is still time to get involved. And so, of course, the end results might look slightly different to how they do now, depending on how many people still fill in the public consultation and what they uh, what the input is. We are also, as I think it was Sarah that alluded to this in her presentation, still encouraging um, and so it's still possible to provide input about the improving the online monitoring system that we have. There is a new story about this on our program website with links to different surveys. So you might be only using a specific part of the online monitoring system, in which case um, you could fill in the survey related to this. So the deadline for those surveys is the 18th of September. And finally, I mentioned we have a stakeholder network group on LinkedIn and um, you'll be able to see that uh, my colleague Anamika is busy typing the links to these groups in the chat function. So if you if you don't know about them, you should be able to click on the links that she is putting in the chat function and see what this is all about. But the stakeholder network, as I mentioned earlier, is very much a platform for sharing information about the new program and keeping everybody up to date about what's going on and the news related to it. Great. Then I think I would like to invite all the presenters today, my colleagues, back on to um, so we can be together in the webinar to answer the questions that were coming up as we went through the different slides. Perfect. We'll come back, Sarah. And we should have Jenny and Anna too. Can't see them, but I think they're there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we are. Yeah, they're yeah. there. Right. Hi, okay. <laughs> Very good. So let's have a look at some of the questions. I could see they were coming in um, as we were going along. Uh, this one is mainly related, I believe, to Jenny and Anna's presentation about the uh, initial analysis. So it is interesting to see that still the average is for all topics between three and four. So all topics seem to be similarly important. Okay. Do you have any um, reflections on that, Anna or, or Jenny? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's clearly the case. Some, um, I think the rankings are between 3.5 and 4.2. So the differences are somewhat minor, but you need to remember that those are weighted averages. So um, that's, I think something that the PPG definitely need to take into consideration, but you can clearly see that some topics are considered more important than others. Um, yeah, I think as a point of observation, I completely agree. Thank you very much. Hope that answers your question. Uh, another one here. What are the consequences of this ranking? Uh, what is your impression? Would you recommend to emphasize one theme more than others? It's back to you, Jenny and Anna, yeah. I think. Yeah, so uh, the point I would like to make here is um, that um, there is no consequence. I mean, it's basically the, the, the survey, we have the survey in order to get your input since you are closer to the challenges you are facing in your region. So if you are facing certain um, difficulties or challenges in your region, then you should, of course, participate and provide us with your input because this is what we need to know where you see the need for a future Interact program. So I wouldn't say due to what you've seen today, you should go into the survey and make your ratings. It's rather about where are the needs in the different regions of the North region program. And may maybe adding to that, we are going to, this is a preliminary analysis. We're going to write a full analysis that will be presented to the members of the program preparation group, which they can then use to feed into the final decision about the thematic focuses of the new program. 
So this is not to say, I mean, this is to say that this will be part of the decision-making basis for the new program. But at the end of the day, it's up to the member states to finalize or to finalize the decision. Yeah, I would like yeah. to add one thing there, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree exactly with, with what Jenny and Anna have said, and I would also like to um, remind you that there are other inputs that go into this whole process. So the public consultation is only one part. The core stakeholders have given their inputs. The scoping study, which is based on looking at the policies more in depth, is also an, a part of this mm -hmm. process. So all of this has to be uh, basically drawn together and then a decision is made based on all of it. Very good. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, hopefully that answered that question. Are there any more questions? Yes. Will social challenges and other topics like Green Europe be taken into account as well? Or will that purely be put under a more social Europe? That is a good question yeah. that we cannot answer as of right now, because at the end of the day, it is up to the member states of the um, North Region program to make that decision. Um, there is a possibility to do that, obviously, to include social and inclusionary aspects under the other thematic areas. Um, whether this is going to be the case, we cannot answer right now. But what is important to, to emphasize that um, if you consider social topics yeah. to be highly relevant that should be addressed, you should point that out clearly in the public consultation yeah. survey to really feed it into and to let the PPT members know that one way or the other, social aspects and inclusionary aspects should be addressed in the new program. Mm. Thank you. I think there was one more question about the, yeah, the scaling. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. difference between the bars seems to be not that great on the scale starts at 3.7 instead of zero. Yeah. That's clearly the case. And we choose that deliberately to display the minor differences to make clear that there are qualitative differences between the ratings. But it is true that, as also pointed out at the beginning of the Q&A, that those are not as big as the bars make to believe. And of course, in the full analysis, we will um, take that in consideration and point that clearly out. This was more to make it more visible yeah. and um, yeah, tangible to the participants. Great, thanks for the clarification. I think um, that I can see th some typing going on in the chat function box. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not sure there's any other new questions. Maybe just give a few seconds to see if there's anything else. So I have a question, Sarah. Yes. When can we expect the first call for project? <laughs> Very good question, Anna. Um, we, as I said during my, my presentation, um, the timeline that you see saw on your screen was based on everything progressing as we hope. As I also said, things could come up. Uh, decisions might not be made on, the, the regulations might not be finalized, or we may not know the budget for quite a while. We don't know. But if things go as we hope, we would launch our first call in the last part of next year. That would be the ideal. So um, we keep fingers crossed that we can get to that point. Um, and then, yeah, hope that it happens. Great, thanks, Sarah. There's a comment come in a chat, but I don't think it had a question mark at the end of it. So I'm just trying to see if I can. No, I think it's a clarification for general. Yeah, clarification. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I see a question. Yes. Um, Maybe a call for the first call of the next program would not be until next year, the latter part of next year, not this year. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a question for you again. No, yeah. Okay. So Rebecca ha asks, uh, will the new calls be one or two step process? Um, that hasn't been decided, but. What we have thus far in terms of inputs on whether it should be a one or a two-step procedure lead us to believe it will be a two-step procedure. Again, that has not been decided, but the overwhelming um, opinions so far are that the two-step procedure works well. 
So we can expect that that will definitely be taken into account when the decision comes up. Yeah. Just uh, as an addition to what you said, Sarah, for the ones of you that are completely new to the program, so when talking about a two-step uh, process, what we mean is in the current program, we have two steps uh, where we first have an expression of interest that needs to get approved in order to get a full application approved afterwards. So just so that you, that you know about what we are talking here. Yeah. Thanks. I think this is for you again, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Will there be bridge funding period between the old and the new periods? Um, as I said already in my presentation, this program period doesn't actually end. It does officially, but in fact, we carry over uh, some of the funding and also the projects that we're running all the way through the end of 2023. So um, in a sense, there is this period where we're running on both program periods, I guess you could say. Uh, whether that's officially bridge funding, I'm not absolutely certain, but we do continue one program while starting the next one. And that overlap is a, a, a roughly two years. Very good. So there was another one I think came in. Yeah, this one. Um, Call for proposals. Project, yeah, yeah, projects comes, yeah. Mm -hmm. If a first call for projects comes at the end of 2021, would it be possible that it would be? Yeah, okay, uh, Martijn, yes, that is a very good question. Um, so for those who are not familiar with this, in this program period, we have been running under this two-step procedure that Jenny explained. But in the first call for proposals that we had, the project applicants had the choice to either go straight into a full application, which is the second step, or apply under what we call the expression of interest, the first step. Um, as I said, we haven't yet made the decision on whether it will be a two-step procedure. So I cannot answer your question um, with absolute certainty. Um, so it is something that we would consider, uh, that much I can say, uh, allowing projects to go straight to a full application in the first call. But we don't know yet. Thanks, Sarah. I think there's another question just come in from Frank here yes. about small project funding. Yes, um, this has not been discussed yet by the program. Um, at, I mean, whether we will actually do this uh, is not known at this moment. So I cannot answer that question. It might be an option, yes. Um, what we're dealing with right now in this program period is Funding, um, we've been affected by COVID. So there are projects, for example, that are not spending all of the money allocated within the time frame that they expected to. So we're trying to get our heads around um, the delay in funding being reimbursed to projects, how much we have returned to us, uh, what we can do with that money. Um, so while it's an option, uh, we don't yet know if there will be a small project funding to bridge between this and next program periods. Great, thanks, Sarah. Is it not similar to have a? Is it not possible to have a similar platform for every interreg program? Um, I think is that referring to um, not like the online yeah. monitoring system. Oh, I mean. oh, is that yeah? Um, yeah, different interreg programs operate with different uh, monitoring systems. Um, and our program has been working with this online monitoring system for two periods at least. I believe we started in the 4B with this and we've been continuing with 5B and we have been getting relatively positive feedback on the system as a whole. So the committee has agreed that we will continue to use this um, into the next program period with improvements. Um, but it is something that, yeah, um, with all interreg programs, we cannot have a uniform use of one system. No. Thanks for clarifying, Sarah. Okay, I think there's maybe some another question coming in now. Mm -hmm. Just give a few seconds to see if anything else comes in, because we still have just a few minutes for some more questions, if there are any. And you might as well make the most of us being here. So. <laughs> 
let's just see if anything comes in that we can have a look at. It's because people can't type quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Talking is faster. Yeah, exactly. The drawbacks of online webinars. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Lisa, you want to take that one? I, I can say about the online conference. Yes, we have a save the date out for the 10th of November. Um, and the, the plan is we're in the planning process for the conference right now, just initially, yeah, working out how what the concept will be like. But um, yeah, as you can see, it will be online this year. So it will most likely be in the morning of the 10th of November. And of course, we will, we're, we're currently investigating how we can make the event as interactive and um, yeah, streamlined as possible, given that it will be online. So this is what we're working on right now. Um, we hope that we'll have some sort of platform where you can go and follow the news about the online conference. So this will be launched, um, yeah, I think sometime in September. So please keep looking on the website for news about the, the North Sea Conference in November. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. Um, from Renska, when might we expect the information about additional funding for current projects? So I guess that's back to you, Sarah. Yes, um, this will be discussed by our monitoring committee um, later this year. Um, but again, we do not know whether that will be the case that we can release uh, funding for additional projects or extensions of projects. I cannot answer that question at this moment. Thanks. Is there a process for the North Sea Conference to engage? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if I read the question right, and my colleagues can intervene if I'm reading it wrong, but I think you mean as part of the conference that you'd be able to um, be able to engage in the content. We are looking at uh, having some sort of online breakout rooms um, as part of the conference and uh, discussing again the developments of the new program. And also because we um, live at the North Sea Conference hand in hand with the North Sea Commission, they will also have uh, the opportunity to present their new North Sea uh, Commission strategy or the North Sea strategy that they have now published as part of the conference. So we're very much hoping it will be technically possible to organize some sort of um, breakout rooms where we can then break out into groups online and discuss um, for both the North Sea strategy and the North Sea program, um, the developments, the latest developments for the new program there. So it's our an ambition to make everything as engaging as possible for the online events. Great, okay. Um, Lisa, I just want to respond to something that someone wrote. It was a, it was a comment rather than a question. Great. Um, Jon asks about the platform or says that he isn't clear what kind of platform we're talking about. And in fact, I'm not sure um, whether the person who asked about the platform was talking about the online monitoring system. But if they were, uh, it is absolutely correct that the program committee decides on that. And they have decided to move forward with improvements to the current system in our program. Thanks, Sarah. And I just seen uh, Rebecca also just there's a, a comment in the chat box about um, a really cool event by the Baltic Sea region. So mm -hmm. that's great. <laughs> we'll have a yeah. look at that and see what they're doing. <laughs> We're actually we've been actually I have to just plug here. We've been really inspired by some of our projects um, because they've had they've made such great efforts putting things online and being so interactive um, during these months. So we've also been looking at what they've been doing too to get some good ideas for the North Sea conference. So mm -hmm. yeah, the well done to all of our projects. Yeah. Super. Are there any more questions? We have a few minutes left, but I think I can't see anything else there in the chat box now. No. Okay, then I think we move towards a close for this for this webinar. Um, a couple of things before we before we shut off and say goodbye. Um, a massive thank you to all of you 
for listening to the webinar, for joining mm -hmm. today. It's been really great to see so many people registered. We, mm -hmm. we didn't, I didn't anticipate so many people would sign up to, to join the webinar. So thank you very much for your efforts and your comments and chats, chat uh, function uh, inputs. It's very much appreciated into making the webinar more lively. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much. And thank you to my colleagues also for their presentations. And hopefully now you will all go away knowing much a bit more about what we've been doing uh, at the JS and what's going on in terms of planning for the new program. So um, we're certainly keeping ourselves busy. One final thing before you go, when you end the, um, the webinar now, please don't close your browser because you will be taken to a survey, just a short evaluation, very short evaluation about what you thought about the webinar. And please, please, please just take two minutes to fill it in because this is obviously a, a kind of new world for us too. And we very much appreciate your appreciate your feedback uh, and seeing how we can do things differently or better next time we have a webinar. So please, please just fill in the short evaluation we have um, at the end when you close the webinar here. And here are our contact details on the screen. Most of you know where we are anyway. If not, now you do and you can just drop us a line. We're very happy to answer your questions. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. And a big thank you to everybody again for joining the webinar today. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.